the purpose of Wealth Talk is to educate, inform, and hopefully entertain you on the subject of building your wealth. Wealth Builders recommends you should always take independent financial, tax, or legal advice before making any decisions around your finances. Welcome to episode 214 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the membership director for Wealth Builders, joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good to be with you again and excited about the number of people who want to share our mission to be great money role models for their children, their teenagers and their young adults. Yeah, thanks to everyone who's been supporting us and attended the webinar, who's now joined the community. We're excited to work with you. And we're continuing today, actually, with someone who's going to be showing up very soon, actually, on one of those family sessions. And this is Will Rainey. He's the founder of BlueTreeSavings.com and the author of Grandpa's Fortune Fables. And uh, Kevin, you've spent some time speaking with Will, he's a fantastic guy and he's got some fantastic lessons which he's sharing. Yeah, he's, uh, he has a gift and a rare gift and, and I immediately gravitate towards it. And it's the ability to make what appear to be complex subjects like money. Money is a complicated thing, isn't it? But he makes it really, really simple. And he simplified that starting with the idea that if you can make it easy for children to understand, and he's got younger children, and that's when they started really from a uh, age of four, if I recall. He's been able to distill those lessons and has a, a warm and engaging style, an ability to, and a determination to write good content. And he'll be working with us in the future to share his content with us and making what uh, he's doing available to our membership. And we want to thank him for that. We recognized for the first time in Wealth Builders, we're not about creating our own content. We're about curating content that's best in world. And uh, he's one of those people who's just brilliant at what he does. And we're delighted to have him as a partner. Yeah, we sure are. And uh, I think it's probably best that we head on over to our conversation with Will and we'll be back soon after that to go through and debrief some of his lessons. All right, over to our conversation today with Will Rainey. Will, welcome to Wealth Talk today. How are you? I'm doing very well. Excited to be here. Yeah, it was so great to have you on because I know you've been speaking with Kevin for probably a good year or maybe even two years, right, since we initially started looking around for wonderful people out there who are promoting financial literacy for children. And you were one of the first people that, that came onto our radar, Will. Oh, I know. It's great. And I remember when Kevin told me about the sort of family program and, and it's so aligned to what I'm doing at the moment. And so I think it's kudos to, to yourself and Kevin for pushing it forward. I'm excited to see the response that you get. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm obviously excited to be working with you. And um, let's understand more about you then, Will, okay, because you've got an interesting background and uh, obviously you're the founder of BlueTreeSavings.com, which is a brilliant website. You can tell us more about that in a moment. And the author of Grandpa's Fortune Fables, which has got so many tremendous reviews on Amazon. I know you're in the process of writing a second book as well. So, So we've got lots to talk about today, Will. So how did you first get into this kind of world of helping children and, and even adults understand more about money? Yeah. So it was never on my long-term plans many years ago. So my background is that I'm, I'm an actuary. So for listeners who don't know what that is, that's essentially an accountant who loves statistics. So I've worked with like retirement schemes and insurance companies and even some governments looking at their long-term kind of risks. But I worked in the investment field. So I did that in the UK. So working with some of the largest retirement schemes in the UK. And then in 2014, I moved to Hong Kong with the, the company I was with to take on this kind of head of investment strategy role across Asia, which was fantastic in the sense of getting to explore Asia because I had to go and do business trips here, there and everywhere. But it was actually around 2017 where I was just having a, a regular meeting with one of my clients and we were just talking about personal stuff. And I was talking about my two young daughters. And he said to me, oh, enjoy this time with them. They only grow up once, which is a completely obvious statement, but it had a really big impact on me. I was like, yeah, they, I do only have this one period of time when they're young. Also, I know that you spend so much, the amount of time you spend with your kids is predominantly when they're like less than 12 years old <laughs> after that. So I thought, right, well, I want to make the most of that. I want to 
to spend more time with my kids whilst they're young. So I told my wife, right, we should leave the corporate world and spend more time with our kids. Clearly, she took a little bit of convincing, but in, in 2019, we both left our corporate jobs, moved from Hong Kong to a small town called Hoi An in Vietnam, which is one of the best places in the world. <laughs> it's beautiful near the beach, near the rice fields, amazing food, amazing people. Put the kids into international school so we didn't go completely rogue and, and hippie-ish. We wanted to have that education. But apart from just having more time with my kids, I wanted to have a bit of a project whilst I wasn't there. I wanted to do something different. And I felt really lucky to be able to have this opportunity. And it's because I've kind of learned how to look after our money. So we've had savings, investments. When we moved from the UK to Hong Kong, we, we kept our properties in the UK. So we we're earning money from those. And so I was like, right, I felt so lucky to be in that position that I want my kids to, to have that opportunity when they're growing up. So I made that my mission. I was just going to teach my kids about money. And so when I was putting them to bed, I'd tell them a story or make up a story which had a money theme to it. And then I started to share some of those stories with friends and family. They really enjoyed them. So then I started to, to write my blog, which is the website Blue Tree Savings that you mentioned. And that seemed to go really well and got kind of picked up by the Financial Times and other media outlets. And yeah, from there, just kind of continued to write different stories and do loads more research around kids and money. It wasn't my passion when I first, I didn't set out a long time ago, this is what I'm going to do. But now it's just all consuming. It's something I'm so passionate about. And there's, there's so much we can do in that area to really empower kids and, and then the parents as well. Fantastic. I mean, so much there to dive into further. I'm glad you mentioned there at the end, you know, your passion now, because it doesn't feel like work, right? You get up every day, you don't have to clock in, you don't have to clock out, you've got the freedom to work as and when you want to. But when you enjoy what you do, you know, you, you put the hours in, right? Because it just doesn't feel like work. Exactly. Yeah, no, and I love that. And so I like routines. So I still every sort of Saturday morning, that's when I write my weekly blog. But yeah, I really look forward to that time where I'm sitting down, go to the same place that I always go to, a little coffee shop and write it. And yeah, just having that passion to do it and, and getting the response as well. Like in the corporate world, you can do a good job and you'll get a few pats on the back from your boss. But when you're getting emails from random people you've never met just saying thank you for the work that you're doing, it just drives you on for doing more and more. And that's led into another income stream for you now, which on top of you mentioned the property and investments, multiple income streams is what we advocate at Wealth Builders and the more pillars, wherever those pillars are, whether it be you know your home, your pension, investments, properties, IP in the form of books and, and products and courses, which you've created as well now, it means that you can kind of ride the wave. You know, Whatever's happening out there in the world, whatever's happening in the economy, whatever's, whatever's happening in the property market, a stock market, you've got different streams of income, which can make sure that you've got that reliability and security every month. A hundred percent. And that's one of the bits I even talk to my kids. I like to talk to them about that kind of piece. So even though we, we invest for our kids and just showing them, they get a few quid in terms of dividends, but we show that to them and say, look, you didn't do any work for that. That's just you saving your pocket money. <laughs> and that pocket money is now growing and they're seeing, I think that could be game changing if they see that from a young age and see it starting to get slowly bigger and bigger from a young age. So yeah, that's fantastic. Let's get into some of these lessons then, Will. And firstly, tell us about your family and uh, who are the members of your family? Yep. So it's my my wife. So I've been married uh, since 2009. And yeah, two young daughters. So they're now 11 and eight years old, moved from yeah, UK, Hong Kong. And we're now actually in, in Thailand, Chiang Mai. So mm. that's how I've got lots of pets. <laughs> Yeah, when we talk about education system in the UK, not really including the topic of money, including the topic of finance, it's always been that way and probably going to be that way for some time. And, and many will say that's not the role of the school to be teaching the children. And we would agree, you know, it's it's more the role of the parent to be able to instill these lessons. And as a parent and as an author of these best-selling books, I guess you sort of tested some of these theories out on your own children, did you, Will? And, and how, did, how did that process start? Yeah, so one of the bits that I started with was getting my kids from the youngest age. So I think my youngest was about four years old when I started. And so we got them to think of money like seeds. 
and said, look, you can take those seeds and you can spend them. And that's just like spending money. But then straight away, they got really curious. They were like, what happens then if you try and plant these seeds? What is that? So for the longest time, we said, like, yep, you can plant those seeds. Those seeds will grow and they'll grow into these trees, which we called blue trees and hence the name of the website. And those trees will produce seeds. So even though they didn't really understand what does it mean when you plant, it just means you're not spending. But they got that. If I don't spend, then this money can grow. And then as they got older, we started to introduce more of the what does it mean when you're planting? So talking about investing and talking about compound interest, where you take those seeds and you plant them and you get more trees, which produce more seeds. And and soon enough, they have this forest. And so it's a really engaging way for them to think about money. And so they visualize this kind of financial forest kind of growing. And so I remember talking to one of my daughters a few years ago, and I said, all right, when you get to 18 years old and you're going to have this forest, are you just going to chop it all down by going on a big spending spree? And they're like, no, we want to look after this forest because they're learning about like the environment at school. And I was like, fantastic. Clearly they talked about like, we'll we'll take off some branches or take a few seeds. And I'm like, yep, that's a hundred percent. If you can nurture that forest over time and let them know that so many people out there don't have a single tree, let alone a whole, whole forest. And so the younger that they start planting these seeds. So that's some of, that was one of the first kind of lessons. And then I've kind of just extrapolated from there to try and talk about many different money topics using that analogy. So on the investment side, where we know that people are scared about investing in the stock market because of stock market crashes. And so we use the analogy to say, well, you've got these trees, which are investments, but every now and then there's some storms. And sometimes the storms come along and break off the top part of your tree. But what do we do in a, after a storm? Well, we just let the tree grow back bigger and stronger <laughs> and it soon produce more seeds. And I think having that mindset of, okay, it's just a storm. <laughs> storms come, storms go, we'll just keep going rather than, them sort of growing up being anxious about their investments. They're like, yep, it's just a storm. We have storms all the time. And so, yeah, so that's been one of the the key lessons that I've kind of instilled and just built on over time. And yeah, the book that you mentioned, I've written Grandpa's Fortune Fables has essentially lots of different chapters, all kind of building on that kind of analogy. I absolutely love that. And, And as you're talking there, Will, I'm thinking, why is this not taught in school? That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it's a really interesting point around, should it be in schools? And I think ideally it should be more in schools than it is at the moment. The key thing about money, and as you all know, money is just not about knowledge. Children, even if they went to school and learned all about the knowledge of money, so what is debt, what is tax, what is in real estate, what is in your stock market, just having that knowledge doesn't always mean that they're going to be good with money. Because money is a lot about psychology. It's about putting good actions into place and having good habits. And it's really hard for schools to kind of help children implement good habits, especially if the parents aren't involved. So if we take the sort of uh, link between wealth and health, if children go to school and learn all about donuts are really bad for your health, be mindful how many donuts you have, but then they go home and their parents have just bought a box of 12 donuts. (laughs) you can see how it's not it's going to be confusing for the children and i think the same thing with with money as well and that's why i've focused a lot on helping parents teach their kids about money such that the parents kind of feel empowered to teach their kids in a simple way but also can role model good <laughs> money behaviors themselves and learn about money in a very non-threatening easy visual <laughs> fun way i say most adults were never taught about money when they were growing up. So actually, they've probably got a similar level of financial IQ as many of their kids. Yeah. And and that's the tagline in the book, isn't it? For kids who want to turn piggy banks into cash cows and for adults to help them understand about money. So so how do you help the adults? Obviously, the books are, are there for the adults to read with their children. Are there particular lessons or additional content that you've created for adults as well? Yeah. So all my blogs that I've written are for adults. And it's for them to learn a money subject in such a way that they're understanding it, but then take this lesson that you've just been taught in this blog and take it to your kids. So for example, it could be about investing in the stock market. And so I sort of shared in that blog about my experience of teaching my daughter. So we're actually sitting in a McDonald's in uh, Hong Kong. And I remember saying to my daughters, did you know that you own a piece of this McDonald's? Because we invest in a 
global index funds. We pretty much every big company we own a small piece of. So, I, and because we invest for our kids, we said you own a piece of this McDonald's, and they got so excited <laughs> about owning that McDonald's, the tray, the bins, all the people queuing up to buy their burgers, some of that money was going to be their money. And it's not just that McDonald's, but all of them. And so they got this really excitement about our oh, investing is about ownership. And then we went out and we saw the, the Apple store and said, yep, you own some of that. And because we were in Hong Kong, we saw Disneyland in the distance and you can say, yep, you own some of that. So I was kind of sharing this story and so many parents who read that blog about how I taught my kids about it said that was just the most simple way of learning about it, not just for my kids, but for themselves, because it was putting it into a kind of a real life example. And when we talked about risks, we talked about blockbuster video, which people can relate to. And that's essentially what I've, my, my passion is now to try and simplify a lot of money subjects to such a way that a child can understand it and then parents can just kind of leverage off that. And so, yeah, the best comments are parents reading the, the blogs or reading the book with the kids saying, I learned so much myself. And it's so I'm hopefully going for two generations in one. <laughs> and it comes back to your point really about it being taught in schools and the theory, but it's the experience, isn't it? It's the keeping it fun. You've researched so much into this topic as well. And the formative years as well, seven years of age, is that is that a key no. a key number? Yeah. So this is some of the research from Cambridge University that they found was by the age of seven, many of the kids have learned many of their money, adult money behaviors by that time, which kind of blew my mind because I was trying to think back to when I was a kid and thinking about what I was doing at seven years old. But it's more about what children are kind of picking up in their daily lives, just as we know, children just absorb. And if from a young age, all children see money as being money is for spending, money is for spending, money, that gets kind of hardwired. And at some point when they're older, they've got to try and unwind that. They've got to say, oh, money's not just for, for spending, but it's been kind of ingrained into them. So, all right, so money's for saving as well, for giving, for investing. Oh, I need to do some of that as well. But after the age of seven, they've got to try and unwind <laughs> that and that what's already been hardwired. So the more that we can talk to kids from a young age about the different uses of money, it's going to be a lot easier to start with good habits. And that's not to say if you've got a 14-year-old who's never been taught about money, they're, they're destined for, <laughs> for doom and gloom. It just means the younger, the better. But yes, yeah, it's about seven years old. It's what they say a habit starts to get ingrained. Yeah, that's interesting. And of course, technology now is allowing younger children to, to understand and again, make it fun, make it playful. You talked about teaching your daughters there about the concept of investing, of compound interest. Have you started introducing any financial products into their lives in terms of savings accounts or debit cards for children? Not yet, mostly because we're here and there's not as much <laughs> financial products. If we were in the UK, then I think still in the UK, we probably would. But it's interesting about that use of technology and those products, because a lot of questions I get asked is, oh, should I be giving my kids cash or should I just set them up with uh, one of these new apps or products? You know, there's pre-funded debit cards that you can get for children. And I've always said, if possible, start with cash. Whilst these new technologies are fantastic and engaging. We miss out on so many natural lessons about money from using cash. So even to the very basic level of when we go into a shop, when we were growing up, we would get some money, we would hand that money over and we'll get on a, a loaf of bread. <laughs> and we can see that there's a transaction going on. We've given money over, we get the bread. Whereas today, children go into a shop, parent gets a loaf of bread, puts it on the till, and they hear this magical beep <laughs> from the watch or the phone or the card. And suddenly the parent just walks away of the bread. They don't actually see that a transaction's gone on unless someone's proactively telling them, did you know when we tap that money that we're giving money to the shop, money's come out from our, our bank account. And so we need to really spend more time sort of making sure kids learn about some of these lessons that we would have picked up naturally. And so the analogy that I use about technology is if you give a child a calculator, they're not just going to be great at maths. If you teach them how to do maths and then give them a calculator, then the world's their oyster. And the same thing with this technology. I'm a bit not worried, but potentially some concerns that some parents will give their kids this technology and assume that this technology is going to 
teach their kids all about money and their kids are going to be fine. Whereas in fact, it, without that education, these kids could be going around right tapping their cards <laughs> all over the place without really understanding what's going on, especially with games now as like computer games, which have money in them. And so kids don't really, they just see numbers on a screen with some kind of money symbol and some of them just don't know which is real money and which is game money. And there's lots of horror stories of parents saying, my kids spent thousands of pounds on Roblox or Minecraft or whatever other games because they didn't realize that they were spending real money. They just thought it was like in-game money. So there's so much that we need to be cautious of with technology. With the education, the technology is, is super powerful. So that's it. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? There are multiple risks which potentially lie but also multiple opportunities and children now who have that creative, that curious mindset can really run with it and they can do some amazing things. And in the last four or five years since you've been obviously writing your blogs and, um, you know, really, I guess, you know, immersed in this topic, Will, how quickly have you seen all of this advance? Because just in the short space time that I know I've been looking at it, just new things coming out almost every week. Yeah, no, so it really is advancing. And again, that's it can be very, very powerful if it's in the right piece. So yeah, so when I go back to the UK, which has not been that frequent because of COVID, and every time I go back and just seeing the sort of technology and getting a chance to look at the nephews, <laughs> uh, what they're using to manage their money. And it's good. They are starting to now embed education into some of those tools. But again, we just need to make sure that kids are, are using that technology in there. But the fact that it's so much easier now for families to help kids look after their money and also invest for their kids and open up an investment account or open up a savings account is so much easier now because of online technology. There's not that whole, I would set up an investment account or a bank account for my kids, but I haven't been to the town center and I've got, haven't taken my passport with me to open the accounts and all that horrible admin that used to go on when trying to open up financial products and services in the past whereas now it's there's some fantastic really within sort of a short amount of time small amounts of money can be put in to just get started and i think that's the key piece is when it comes to money a lot of it is just getting started uh, and now that that barrier has been taken which is fantastic absolutely that's true but one thing that hasn't changed though is is the principles around money I know that in, in your book, there's many principles there. Of course, we've yeah. recorded the seven family wealth principles. And um, going back to some of those classic books, I can think Richest Man in Babylon, right? Just spend less than you earn is a simple rule that still works today and will always work. What are some of the other principles and foundational lessons that are included in your book, Will? So the interesting one, the one you just mentioned there around spend less than you earn, and I think I've kind of talked about that in the book that we've got there, but I've also put in a story to un- help kids understand why people don't do that. Cause it's such a simple thing to say, right? Just spend less than you earn. And, but yet whatever crazy percentage of people just don't do that. I think it's like 60% of the UK are in, are in debt, excluding mortgages, which shows like 60% of people are, are not following that, that first rule. And so talking about to kids, why aren't people doing that? And it's all about the fact that companies are spending millions, collectively billions on great marketing and they know us more than we know ourselves especially with all the data from social media and so it's all about helping the kids get into habits and say right you have to whenever you get some money get into the habit of putting at least one out of every 10 away so it can't be touched because if you don't do that it's going to get swallowed up (laughs) and i've got kind of fun stories to help kind of kids learn about that so i use that forest that i mentioned earlier so the first one is make sure you save one out of every 10 seeds that you receive. And if you want to grow a forest, so that's the first thing. The second principle is your seeds are never going to grow if they're just put under the bed (laughs) or in a jar. You have to plant those. And so we're talking to them about trying to make that money grow, whether that's investing in the stock market, whether that's in a high savings interest account, or whether that's trying to think of a little business and and buying some lemons to try and make lemonade and try and make that, that money grow. But the third one that I talk a lot about in principles and I don't think it gets spoken about enough is just patience. All of the people I know who are financially secure have patience. And with patience, it means that they're not going to use 
gambling, they're less likely to uh, bad debt, they're less likely to get scammed. They're going to be more patient when investing. <laughs> they're not going to just look at the newspaper every every day going, where's the, where's the stock price? They're going to be that much more patient. And they're also not going to spend spontaneously and fruitlessly if they've got that patience. So I talk a lot about uh, in my blogs and in, in the chapter in the book about patience. And when I do some workshops with some companies, I talk about how parents should really look to try and teach their kids to be patient. And so it could even be saying kind of get them to save just one little piece of that chocolate bar and put it in the fridge for the next day or the next weekend or wherever it is, just so they can see that that there's the next the following day they go to the fridge and they've got that extra little bit. Because if they have eaten the whole chocolate bar the first day, they would have probably been happy. But if they get to eat 90% of that chocolate bar, they're probably going to be just as happy. But that extra 10% that they delay, they'll be really happy they did the next day. And so it's just getting children to learn that patience is rewarded. Patience doesn't mean you can't have any of the chocolate bar. You have to, can't eat any of it. It's all about have most of it, just save a little bit. And so, yes, they're the free, what I call the free rules of wealth in the book, which kind of leverage off, I say, richest man in Babylon, um, rich dad, poor dad, and psychology of money. And so, yeah, keep one out of every 10 seeds, plant the seeds that you keep, and then be patient and let those trees grow. And then if they follow those three rules and make them into like their kind of habits with all the money they receive, then I'm sure they'll have a, a nice big financial forest when they're when they're older. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure everyone who's listening now would 100% agree with that. But how many were actually told that when they were younger? Very few, unfortunately. You know, certainly wasn't a conversation I was having with my parents. Another thing I'm interested to hear your opinion on, Will, is learning styles and personality types. We use a tool in the Wealth Builders community with our members called Wealth Dynamics, which is aimed at the adults. And there is a version for uh, for young young adults and children. But We understand that people learn differently. Some, you know, learn through creativity and the big picture thinkers. Others are connection. Others are about doing and experiencing. And others are very detailed and they need to have all the details and the information before they make any decision. How does that reflect in some of the work and the research that you've done in terms of being able to teach people effectively? Yeah, no, so same thing with children that they all will learn and engage in different ways. And I think it's for the parents to just trial and error around this. And it's even with the same child, sometimes just with my daughters, I've said the same lesson many times to them because I know it's never going to be a case of I tell them once and it's gone into their brains and they're now forever never going to use bad debt or they're going to save all their money. It's about constant sort of reinforcing and very kind of micro lessons. And so with my daughters, I kind of try and mix it up in terms of how I give those lessons, whether that's bedtime stories, whether that's getting some Monopoly money and sort of saying, so one game we did the other day was got some Monopoly money. I said, right, pretend this is income mommy and daddy have. How much of this do you think we get to keep? And then we kind of just took, started taking some of the notes. So this is how much we pay for the house. This is how much we pay for electricity, internet. And they could start to see this big pile of cash that was there just sort of dwindling down. And it's much more engaging for them because it was visual. But other times, so it's even playing games. Sometimes it's listening to some songs and sort of asking some questions. All right, why do you think? Because there are quite a lot of popular songs that mention money and sort of having those kind of mini micro lessons such that some of them they will engage with and some they might not, but you're kind of just reinforcing and trying to go from different angles. And I don't think I've got a formula to say, if your child is like this, then do that. If your child is like this, do that. At the moment, it's more, I just know that different days and as they grow up, the different method will change (laughs) and be more. So it's more about just try lots of different methods. It'll keep engaging for kids, but also the parents as well, as they're not just sitting there lecturing their kids, but trying to be interactive. Now, I mentioned earlier on you're writing your second book, Will. Can you give us any any sneak preview of what to expect in there? Yeah, so it's interesting. So the first book came out a couple of years ago, and now my eldest daughter's uh, a bit older. So I'm kind of seeing what books are interesting for her. So she's 11 years old, and she's now into sort of like mystery books and books with clues in there. So yeah, so this book, next book's all about uh, a character who's kind of gone missing and so the kids in the book have to try and just uncover what's happened to this 
their, their grandmother in this next book. But as they sort of try and uncover where she's gone or what's happened to her, they kind of learn about her money history, about how she started off with not much money, but then she gets some money and how she earns money and, and looks after it, but all in little mini stories that have different clues in there and different characters in there. So so it's trying to, hopefully by the time my kids are 18, I'll have a series of books which all then target different age groups. So the first one's probably... I've sort of said sort of six to 12 years old. This next book will probably be from like nine to 13. And then as my kids come teenagers, I have another book for them. So yeah, it's trying to develop them. But a lot of the same principles are the same. Um, I say even with the book, there's some new topics in there, but there's also a few topics that are from the, the previous book. And again, but written in a completely different story. <laughs> so again, trying to reinforce some of the, the key principles, because as you mentioned earlier, it's, the key principles don't change. And there's always that tendency of, oh, I have to talk about something completely new. And sometimes it's not. It's about saying the, the key principles, but in a different way, and just hoping that the more times you rephrase them, the, the more it'll stick. Yeah, we absolutely love your work, Will, and you can't wait for that second book and also can't wait to work with you closer with our members as we start to develop and evolve the Wealth Builders Families program and uh, be inviting you in there to do some guest sessions, I very much hope, and when the new book is out to uh, share that with our members. And just for people listening right now, Will, so much content already that's freely available on your blog, across socials, where's the best place for them to go to begin that search? So my website is the best place, um, bluetreesavings.com. On there, you can find all of the information about all the different blogs. I've pretty much covered most <laughs> money topics from there, but also it has details about my current book, which is Grandpa's Fortune Fables, which is also available on Amazon. In terms of social, I spent most of my time doing tips on LinkedIn. So yeah, look for Will Rainey on LinkedIn and I generally try and post a few times a week with some helpful tips for, for parents. Yeah, absolutely. Recommend you head there right now. And uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Will. So much more we could have talked about, but uh, I have no doubt that we'll be talking again on a future episode, not too distant future. Perfect. No, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed that. All right. Thanks, Will. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Will there. I just love some of the concepts. So we'll get into those in a second. Before we do that, we've had more reviews this week coming in on our Trust Pilot page. Thank you to everyone who takes the time to leave reviews for us. It's so important to help us grow and to help us spread the word to more people. And this week, John has left some words. He says, having spent over two years going around in circles and getting nowhere with others, Wealth Builders support to not only move my SaaS pension scheme to another cheaper and more proactive provider, but to also help both me and my wife move our final salary defined benefit pension funds to the SaaS when others couldn't was a breath of fresh air. And Paul Brooks in particular was extremely supportive and proactive throughout the process, which included helping us to find the right IFA and SAS fund. And everything was concluded and with funds transferred with around eight months, and they are now available for us to invest. I'd thoroughly recommend Wealth Builders if you need help and support with anything relating to SAS pensions. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks to John for that. And I think you could tell from John's review that he planted some seeds, didn't he? It took him some months to be able to get that result done and some and some connections. So let's say some, you know, some interaction with that. So everything needs nurturing in order to do it well. And while I want to make a comment that Wealth Builders doesn't give advice, it's not a place of advice, it's a place of guidance and connection. So uh, Paul Brooks, nor me, nor anybody else in Wealth Builders gives advice, but we know people who do and they're, they're responsible. But thanks to John for that, but also thanks to Will, because one of the key messages that Will gives is really a reflection of one of our own principles, a metaphor for life, and I think he's embedded it more than anybody else, which is the concept, Chris, of planting seeds. Definitely, yeah, and seeds grow into blue forests. Wonderfully and simple concept to get children to understand that money needs to be treated in a very, very visual way, not just in the tactile nature of touching money, which you mentioned, particularly in the buying and selling of things and the transactions but also in the concept of the future. And uh, so some really, really interesting analogies that flow from that, including the storms, you know, that, that can damage forests, but they don't blow them away. 
um, and that you can weather storms and you've got flexibility within that. And, and also the idea that the trees themselves generate seeds and those seeds then plant themselves and then you're creating a forest and you want to keep your forest growing. And I think that's very elegant in how he does that. A really great take on, again, how we're, we're approaching that. I'm just pleased that he's managed to do such a good job in sharing that. Absolutely. And we talk generally in Wealth Builders with our members. We have a roadmap. We teach the nine steps of the roadmap to move from financial insecurity to financial independence. The only way to generate asset income is from one of the seven pillars. And uh, Will was able to relocate because he'd already put the time in himself. So building his own assets through property, through investments, through recurring income streams that allowed him to say, you know what, we want to spend time with our children. We've got income and we don't have to stay here. And that gave him that freedom of location to go and travel, live in Vietnam initially. He's now in Thailand, put children into international schools. But that's all because of that asset income that he built up himself. And without that, he wouldn't have been able to do it. Well, also the catalyst, you know, I often talk, Chris, don't I, about a a catalyst, that reason to overcome inertia as an ROI. And uh, he mentioned that, uh, I think, a casual conversation with someone who says, kids only grow up once, you know. And he's like, well, yeah, I want to be there for that. I want to see that. I want to participate in that. That ability to do that, and certainly that's a calling for many people who want to go into business or get into some way of being able to be flexible with their time so that they can spend quality time with their children growing up. And I think that's a very laudable thing and good for him that he's been able to not just place himself and his wife and family in that position, but he's also uh, been able to reinforce the the messages, not just to his family, but to other families as well. And I love that idea he mentioned about the leverage of a couple of generations. You know, you're, you're teaching the parents how to fish. You're not just giving them a, a fish. And I think there's an important point about schools also, and I've made this point and Will makes the same point, although slightly different language. He talked about schools teach, and that's sort of almost, I think he said you can't learn wealth in books. You can't because you've got to have habits, you've got to have perseverance, you've got to do the nurturing. You can't just read a book about seeds and then not do anything. That's just, you can didactically be taught and you can understand, but without the practical application, it doesn't do anything. And I think he makes that point well too, and we see so many people, don't they, Chris? Buy a book, buy a course, listen to a podcast. Could be you, Mr. Listener, Mrs. Listener. Are you taking action? Are you doing something to plant your own seeds and nurture your own family? And these are good things to be considering. And we hope we can become a catalyst for someone to go, it's time. It's time to make that change. It's time to be a great money role model for your children. Take the the quiz to find out what type of money role model are you. And maybe that might give you a shock or a job because we want to do that because we believe we've got an obligation to make responsible children into responsible adults. And uh, I'm not going to shy away from that one, Chris. And no. neither is Will. No. In our launch webinar last week, we talked about the seven family wealth principles, and that's embedded in the Wealth Builders for Families program, and we'll be bringing in experts, authors, speakers to talk about different aspects of that. And one of those principles, you've talked about planting seeds. Another one is products. And um, I like the way that Will said, starting with cash, you know, keep it tangible. And that's a question he gets often because um, you miss valuable lessons when everything is just tap and touch. I think we've said this many, many times already in different podcasts, Chris, about that. He makes a great point about making money tactile at the very beginning so that there's a there's that sensory relationship with it, whether it's very young children just playing with money and, and virtual shops to coin rubbing to playing with monopoly money to going shopping and, and physically seeing money and, and using money instead of cards in order to let children see that there is a process of exchange that's going on because in the end, these are life lessons that can't be just absorbed by here's a tap, here's a tap, here's a tap, because then they just think money's on tap. And 
and it, and it is not. So the uh, lessons need to come from there. So, yeah. But, of course, we'll be bringing products and uh, concepts of the latest developments in in products from time to time for our UK audience. We can't speak for Thailand, but we can speak about various products that are designed to introduce children in a positive way or introduce parents and grandparents in a way to help that savings mentality, that planting seeds mentality, and the tax efficiency that sometimes goes with that, with junior ISAs, junior SIPs, and so on. Uh, And we'll constantly keep a vigil on that to make sure that you're getting the latest. So we'll deliver the principles of these are the things you, you could look at, but we'll be getting case studies from parents who discover a new product, a new app, a new service, and we'll do our best to test those things out to bring them to more families so that they can use whatever the best of technology is to help those lessons come across. Absolutely. And one final parting word from Will was that the importance of exercising patience, which again ties into planting seeds, but saving that piece of chocolate for tomorrow might seem like a a small message, but one that demonstrates the benefit of delayed gratification. And when it comes to wealth, that it takes time and it's not everything today. Yeah. Well, it's also nice that Will shares a love of coffee. I'm always in uh, in a coffee shop, sitting down doing something and he seems to write these blogs there. So good to know that he's uh, got that location freedom. One of the great freedoms of wealth, isn't it? To live where you want on your terms. So to sit in a coffee shop, to write a blog and know that you're going to influence. And something I, I, that I was touched by actually, didn't make a big deal of it, but I thought it was very, very powerful that Traditionally, you know, when you're in a job or you're in a business, you might get a pat on the back from a boss. You won't get a pat on the back from employees. You're If you're running a business, the pat on the back is the bank balance. But when he said random people, strangers you've never met, send you an email and say, thank you for the work you're doing. And we get that too, don't we, in our reviews. And I'm always humbled by that. That somehow somebody we don't know is touched by our work and it's making a difference in their lives. And and Will's doing the same thing. So, Will, you and I, sir, are kindred spirits. And I'm delighted you're part of our uh, partnership. And we're looking forward to working with you, not just now, but for a long time in the future. Here, here. So I hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode with Will. Don't forget to go and check out his blogs. And uh, we'll be having Will talk to our members inside the families community in the coming weeks. So we're looking forward to that as well. And uh, we will be back same time, same place with more fun and frolics next week, Kevin. (laughs) Fun and frolics indeed to families. Looking forward to that. And I'll tell them, my friend, see ya. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget that we are constantly updating our resources inside the Wealth Builders membership site to help you create, build and protect your wealth. Head over to wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership right now for free access. That's wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership. 